So this next um, module or section, as I said, is if you, you know, go from the idea of your construct, your theory, now, you know, get the brass tacks, what rubber hits the road, how do we start designing for dis um, dissemination implementation, for diffusion, um, and how might we think about applying those constructs? My, my talk here is going to be getting you to think through it in a systematic way. Ideally, what you would have next to you is you'd have your framework that you're using. And as you go through this, you're thinking about the constructs on your framework, all right? And that's why we're using the re-aim exercise towards the end, is to practice doing that. But I'm going to walk you through kind of the approach, the steps to go about doing it. I'm taking about 15, 20 minutes to get ourselves oriented. And then what we've brought in are some excellent um, case vignettes from um, local experts here on how they've actually applied their frameworks and thought about the designing and, um, of their various uh, dissemination and implementation interventions. We'll go through each of those and then it'll allow it up for question and answer. So it's to learn from each other what, what's, what are, as, as Russ was saying earlier, are there surprises, are there questions, are there hurdles you've faced? You'd like to use this group to get your feedback because we truly are very fortunate to have some of the national leaders in the field here with us today. So now is the time to ask questions while they're available. Okay. After this, we'll have lunch. So it, this will be about an hour and a half. So think of it that way, too. OK. <laughs> so <laughs> the learning objective is I will be identifying resources for you to think through to help you with your design. And we, through the case vignettes, will be um, presenting information and demonstrating how to think about designing for DNI. Now, the gentleman asked the question, are there any unifying constructs across these various um, 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 uh, theories and frameworks and models and so forth? And so that for me, on a planning mode, this is how I've kind of conceptualized it. Um, you know, for those that have seen the plan, do, check, act cycle, you know, it's kind of analogous to that. This is, um, I, for those that may not know, I used to be in the private sector and how we would design these things in a more pragmatic, applied way. And this would be where you would start. So I'm going to walk you through that thinking um, and just to kind of set the stage. And we'll go through each of these individually. So starting, you know, sometimes we want to jump right in and start designing and implementing and so forth. But it's a good to check yourself, what is the evidence that you're really wanting to disseminate and to implement? And is it worthy of translation? And this is discussion that does happen in national forums. You know, we're all energized to start, you know, boots to the ground. Um, but do we have the right plan? What is the evidence? So how do we look at that? The second one is it, it starts to build a little bit along the line of what Russ was talking about as he was describing the intervention, right? Who is the audience? that you are working with. And I will, as I go through this, get you to think maybe a little bit more broadly as to who's the audience or the target for the change or behavior, what have you. And then who are the related stakeholders that may be secondary audiences or maybe facilitators or could be barriers that you should think about. Um, and once you have an understanding of their um, beliefs, their attitudes, their current habits and practices. Now, how do you start to engage your audience in a way that helps to facilitate the ultimate dissemination and translation? And then the translation phase is what I might call, how do you now start thinking about applying the framework that you have? Right? So as you are, you, you, you're basically doing your homework on the first three steps that set you up in a good way so you can now be prepared to apply the framework towards translation. Um, how do you tailor it, the communication, so it meets, the, it speaks to the needs of the audience? How do you now, having done that homework, think about the potential barriers and facilitators and you can be um, thoughtful in your process of either planning for that or in the evaluation stage thinking of that? Okay, so I'm just going to go through a slide or two on each one of these just to get us grounded. So the first one is the evidence for intervening compelling. Um, and I think there's, you know, where is the evidence on that continuum, if you will, of being demonstrated? 
Um, sometimes the evidence we have is what we call efficacy, or effic you know, it's been shown to be efficacious. You know, the classic sense is you have a new drug, it's been proved in these various rigorous, well-controlled, but narrowly defined populations in these clinical trials. Um, but in essence, efficacy means has, has your intervent or your evidence been shown to work under ideal conditions? Um, then the next level is effectiveness, as it's often defined, is more under real-world conditions. You know, we deal with real patients that have comorbidities, they have um, socioeconomic determinants that are impacting their health, they're in a context, in a setting, we deal with very heterogeneity of the data, of the patients, et cetera. Has the, what you're trying to intervene been shown to be effective in that setting? Or are you the first one that's trying to translate it from the efficacy side to demonstrate it can work in real world? Are you the fifth one that's now working? It's been shown to be effective in certain populations, but now you're working in a specialized population or community or group of people. So it's just thinking through what is the evidence. If you're in a grant side, you would need to say, I'm, I'm not just creating evidence for the sake of disseminating, implementing, but rather there are standards there that I'm taking that as accepted, and now I'm figuring out how to get it out in the real world. So the you know, places to check, uh, as I know you're all are well aware, are what's out there in terms of systematic literature reviews in your field, meta-analyses, what might be published guidelines, both in medical associations or public health, U.S. Preventive Task Force. And, and we're probably all pretty familiar with searching for that kind of information within our own discipline, within our own scientific field. But I wanted to also make you aware of some other resources and sites that try to pull together or synthesize across many of these organizations. One of those activities is sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and its Effective Healthcare Program. Um, and out of this come many reports in which they are synthesizing the literature, systematic reviews, and coming up with what does the evidence show for various kinds of treatments. Now, this one I pull here is, you know, management of chronic kidney disease. You know, they will tend to focus on what's the highly prevalent conditions um, and so forth. So it may not actually have what you need, but it's a good place to check to see how are they framing what is evidence that should be um, disseminated. I mentioned this earlier as well as the choosing wisely. So if you are interested in um, what is appropriate use of certain cancer screening or certain diagnostics and so forth. Choosing widely is a foundation that's actually inter, um, interdisciplinary with many, as I said, leading medical associations. And each of those associations have identified what might be their top five focus areas. Um, so if, for instance, they want to make sure um, you know, um, vaccinations or uh, cancer screenings or so forth are being targeted, triaged to the right kind of population. This may be a site where they've pulled together those organizations and it's already synthesized um, consensus statements around that. All right, but the point here is that you should be starting from some evidence that's been shown. Otherwise, you're at a phase of you're still demonstrating effic um, that it's efficacious. Okay, so once you have an idea of your evidence, you know the field that you're working in, whether it be public health oriented or a clinical oriented um, context, it's thinking through very clearly then what is your audience. Now audience comes out of the communication literature largely in which we think of them as the recipient of your communication, right? So an audience in a show, an audience um, is how you think about, you know, who's listening to radio or television, that's an audience for TV. But it's also who's the recipient of your intervention, okay? So we tend to think of our audience as being patient or public. We tend to think of our audience might be physicians or care providers, right? Um, and these are the ones where we tend to focus our energy. But there's also this sort of group of stakeholders, people who might have a vested interest, and these can be individuals, groups, organizations, and they have an interest or concern in, I say, intervention. But it's the thing that you're trying to disseminate and implement. 
It may not be the group that you're trying to convince to actually do that behavior like a patient, but it could be a group that cares about that in a way that could either help or hinder what you're doing. So the step here is to think, you know, systematically, who might these folks be as you're starting to plan? And it, again, it's in the context of your setting. So if you're in a clinic setting, you might be thinking, therefore, the stakeholders in a very, you know, defined uh, clinical population in terms of staff, in terms of the administration. Or you could be thinking about your stakeholders from the context of a population and, you know, really thinking broadly on a community and, you know, politicians and, and businesses in your community all, um, all can be included. This is, um, you know, there are different frameworks. I was involved in the development of this one, so of course you're a little biased in what you develop. But I think it's just, you know, it's not rocket science. It's just being thoughtful. You know, we defined it as seven P's framework um, of identifying who are your stakeholders and just going through and being rigorous, being thoughtful and systematic. You know, which type of patients are you, in a, are you really um, focusing on? Which kind of providers? And then, you know, not in the abstract sense, but if you're working in a certain healthcare setting, you would say, I know exactly which provider is the key decision maker in my unit, and I need to make sure that person's on board, that a champion, for example, right? But uh, if you're in healthcare, you might be thinking of purchasers and payers. This is where you start to get government in, you know, so if you're dealing with disadvantaged Individuals, uh, perhaps at a community health center, you know, to what degree are purchasers and payers involved as you're, as you're thinking of your strategies. Policy makers, um, these can be individuals that are establishing a formulary, establishing the protocol within your particular setting. Um, it could be a policy maker for the state as to where the public health priorities are for the state. So, you know, in Colorado, they have 10 winnable battles. Is your intervention area you're interested in part of their 10 winnable battles? Might, how might you involve uh, those stakeholders who are policymakers? And, you know, sometimes I'll jump to principal investigators. We needed another P. But this is really researchers. You know, are there other researchers, funders, you know, your um, program officer that you should be thinking about as well is, is their, their thoughts are around what you're proposing. And I'll conclude with product makers. Now, these would be manufacturers, but the products could be the manufacturer of an electronic health record system, as well as a product if you're trying to do diabetes prevention, perhaps there's um, medicines that are involved, or screening device manufacturers. And I know sometimes, um, you know, in an academic setting, those are, you know, not folks that are often brought to the table. But sometimes if there is win-win situations, um, ideas can be brought that can help facilitate it. Um, I, I, I think of one that comes to mind in which, you know, the beverage industry was trying to, you know, it was in their best interest to take um, sweetened uh, beverages out of schools in the vending machines. Um, they needed to do that um, because it, um, you know, for PR, because it's the right thing for public health, et cetera. Um, and so they actually had a distribu distribution, and they managed the contracts with all of these high schools. And it was because folks like Bill Clinton brought them to the table that they were able actually to get the intervention implemented a lot faster than if probably individuals not working with them had tried to do it on their own. So I just give that out as an example. The main point is to be thinking thoughtfully through this, who are my stakeholders and what do I know about them? So it's doing the homework. And we might call this formative research. But essentially for each group, each consumer or customer of what you're working on, do you have a good understanding of their knowledge, their attitudes, their beliefs, their norms, their motivations? Right? We're all human, and you need to have this understanding in order to understand how to frame your message, how to frame the intervention, so it doesn't add complexity, it's compatible, it's something that's easy to incorporate. And these are principles that come out of diffusion theory that you often, you know, I know there are constructs in CIFR that relate to these as well, but it starts first with understanding what are current habits and practices, norms and beliefs. Um, and sometimes this is in the literature, when people are studying an area, they're investigating, they're doing surveys, they're doing um, 
qualitative ethnographic. Um, sometimes this is in gray literature. If you have a patient foundation, for example, an advocacy group, they often are off out doing surveys, collecting data like this as well. It may not end up in PubMed, but it may end up as a report that they press release or issue. So you may want to also look in the gray literature for this kind of information. It may mean you need to do some of your own formative work before you embark on designing your own intervention. Um, and um, it may mean you need to engage, which brings me to the next um, segment here, which um, is now that you've identified who um, you're working with, how might you engage with them as a partnership in the process? Not as uh, they're my study subjects, and I'm going to do something on that population, but how do I work together? But it's being choiceful here because I, I put down here a couple of references that relate to community um, participatory based research principles. Another one that has framed it in, in health affairs more in the context of um, health care interventions. But you have to, if you are going to involve a, a group to engage with them, you know, are you involving them at the level of consultation, of listening? Are you involving them at the level of involvement that you're going to allow, you know, um, patient preferences to be involved? Or are you truly at a stage of partnership and shared leadership and the level of engagement and energy that you need to invest in that is much higher? And so don't, you know, don't pretend to say you're engaging if all you're asking is a survey. You know, engaging really is developing partnership and that means you have to be open to the possibilities that they might want to reframe your intervention your study question, in fact, that's probably a good sign. It means they're engaged enough that they want to be committed to your end output. So as you listen to some of our speakers talk, they are very, they have wonderful, rich stories uh, along this line, and you should be listening for what they've learned in the process of their own work. I, I call this out um, um, boot camp translation. Sometimes it's helpful when you're writing a grant is to have a reference that you can cite. This is a very nice one that has been developed here locally on campus um, um, with Jack Westfall, with um, his collaboration with communities. And it's a nice description of how they've actually organized around doing this translation. Very practical. You know, they call a meeting together, what they've done with follow-up teleconference calls, emailing. And it gives you a protocol for thinking about how to plan according to that. Um, if you want further information on that, Don Neese, who's now um, leading a, a lot of that effort here on campus, gave a, a seminar uh, last month at our CRISP seminar series, and you can see slides where he walks you through in more detail. Now, at the stage of translation, this is where you, you're using your framework. Um, and I, I borrow from some of the quotes from um, what Ross, uh, Ross had in, in their recent paper this year. Um, and I think, I, I think of these as pearls of wisdom as you embark on applying your framework. Is remembering that dissemination does not occur spontaneously, naturally. Its passive approaches are, are not effective. You've got to be thinking of active interaction um, that's multi-level, multi-source messaging. Um, it's comprehensive. Um, and um, the process of dissemination should be tailored to these various audiences. It might mean that you have to develop different kinds of materials and information, same, same intervention, but it speaks differently to the different audiences in a way that they see the benefit to them. And by, as I said earlier, using the framework increases the likelihood. There are several um, you know, online tools or checklists to help you through this sort of I might call framework-enabled planning tools. We are covering several here today, um, um, and so these will, are available on our site. Um, we're going in many of these in depth that you'll get to hear more of those details. But they're nice tools that are checklists to help guide you. Um, these are other sources for before you reinvent the wheel and create your own dissemination implementation you know, materials, you might want to also check to see if there's already been something that's been developed in your area. So ARC maintains an innovations exchange. These are largely successful demonstration projects in various healthcare fields. The CDC also has tools for community action, which are, again, designed to be able to maybe take off the shelf and maybe apply or tweak to your particular setting. 
Um, I'm just going to close here before we move to the speakers with, um, I think social market marketing was mentioned as an early field. I, I have experience in marketing, so I like to refer back to these words of wisdom as well. And, and when you are really thinking of these very large problems around how do you prevent diabetes or prevent cardiovascular disease, you know, it can be somewhat overwhelming. So as you think of your interventions, can you, can you identify audiences or groups that are most ready for action? They're there. They just need a little enabling. They want to do it. Their norms, their beliefs are such that they want to do it. They need some enabling. Um, can you promote single, doable behaviors? Right? A very simple thing for people to do that might have significant impact. Start simple, stay focused. Present the value of your intervention in real benefits in the present. So a lot of what we do in health is preventive, um, and it's hard to imagine why I should do this now when my benefit might be something that happens 20 years from now. How can you make the benefits real today? There's a reason why you see those direct-to-consumer advertising for arthritis drugs, and they're showing people holding grandchildren and being active today. They're trying to take the benefit and make it tangible, right? Um, and, and thinking about what might, and, and planning for what might be barriers such that you might remove the barriers. And we'll be talking um, further around evaluation, but thinking of the evaluation as tracking results in real time not just as evaluating at the end of a two-year study, but what can be um, gathered as you go along to make adjustments. And this is where you get the tension between the adaptability, flexibility that you might need versus the fidelity that you might want. Um, and we'll, I'm sure, have more discussion around that. So here are the you know, checklists for action. Thinking about what specifically are you disseminating and implementing? What's the level of evidence? Who are your audiences? Who are the stakeholders? Do you have an understanding such that you can present the value-added benefit of what you're trying to get implemented in a way that's meaningful to the community you're working with and really strategizing around barriers and facilitators? So with that general background, we'll move on to the panelists. We've asked each of them to, tr and it's very hard to do this. We're trying to model what might be a TED-type talk where we're asking people to talk 10 minutes. They could spend a whole day here talking about their research. So we're trying to stay focused on what might be a case vignette example from their field and what might be three nuggets or pearls of wisdom from their own experience that they can pass along to you all. Um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So we're trying to stay on time. We'll, we'll do the best that we can on that. And, um, and then we'll allow uh, lots of rich discussion at the end. Um, and so I'm really pleased that we have a really excellent set of experts that are going to, and as it turned out, their case examples are somewhat um, complementary to one another. So Arnie um, from Kaiser will be speaking of well child care in a large HMO sec um, context. Uh, Ali Kemp will be also talking about child care, childhood vaccination with a community health care setting context. So you can see how they might be adapting their interventions differently in those settings. David Goff and Spiro Manson are both speaking about diabetes prevention efforts, but in different settings in different communities. So you can see how they are thinking about their audience their stakeholders, the needs there, and how they may be adapting the evidence for diabetes prevention to those settings. Okay? So with that, um, I will ask Arnie to come up first. Oh, um, and then just to listen for, I think I've covered all of these. Um, I think so. Okay. Do you want to use this? Everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, well, good morning, and uh, Elaine, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to talk uh, briefly, I'll try to keep it within the limit, um, about a project that we did at Kaiser um, a few years back, actually, with funding from the Commonwealth Fund to uh, implement um, a new model of well child care in our system. And we used uh, implementation dissemination concepts to, to do this work. But the background for this, um, those of you who are pediatricians, uh, this is probably preaching to the choir, but 
We know that uh, developmental um, uh, assessment is, is um, not done uh, routinely all the time in uh, the well-child visit. Um, there's a gap between what's sort of uh, what the parent needs are and what's being addressed. Um, for example, 50% of the uh, parents, um, their child's development behavior issues were not addressed adequately. So there's sort of dissatisfaction on the part of the parents um, and in some cases in part of the pediatricians in terms of being in a work situation that uh, <clears throat> doesn't allow them to do some of the kind of um, developmental and behavioral um, uh, anticipatory guidance work that they'd like to do uh, because of limited resources and time. Um, so this was sort of setting the stage for us to try a different model, to experiment with a different model of implementing well-child care in our system. What we came up with was an approach that was somewhat risk-based, and the idea would be that we would tailor content and frequency of the well-child uh, care visits to the needs of the family and vulnerability of the child. And we would, we would uh, combine different types of visits that we would test out. For example, an e-visit through secured messaging system in our uh, electronic me medical records. Um, uh, Web-based visit, uh, web-based assessment prior to the visit. We use a program called CHAT, it's Child Health and uh, uh, Development Interactive System that actually um, uh, has parents complete some of these assessments like the ASQ and CHATIS before the visit. Um, and this was done to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of the visit so that, you know, the, the forms weren't all being completed there. At the higher end of the risk spectrum, of course, we have kids with special health care needs. And uh, at Kaiser, we have pediatric uh, care coordinators for these individuals. And what we wanted to do there was lengthen the visit time and make it uh, available for a co-visit with the pediatric care coordinator and the pediatrician to do a better job of coordinating services among a lot of different providers in our system. So we started this by identifying some clinics that we wanted to go to and try this out. And see, these would be early adopter clinics, essentially. And they were three um, medical offices, uh, large medical offices in our system, um, which uh, uh, they were brave enough to raise their hands and say we would uh, be interested in participating. And what we decided to do in terms of the implementation process was identify in those practice settings who the opinion leaders were and how they interacted with each other and what are patterns of influence. And for that, we used uh, a method called social network mapping. And um, Russ had been involved in this project as well as Jim Deering, and Jim had uh, provided us with some of the, the methods and um, analytic approaches to doing social network mapping, which was new to me. But in addition, we also did focus groups and stakeholder interviews, um, and that included uh, parents, too, actually, in our, uh, in our interviews about how they felt about uh, the, the, these different well-child care models, what, what, what would be uh, attractive to them and what wouldn't be. Um, and then uh, we, with this information, um, began to implement and test at these three sites the, the well-child model. And for our evaluation, the basic outcome we were interested in is were we improving or increasing developmental and behavioral screening and referral rates? Um, so the use of the ages and stages questionnaire, the chattis, um, and so on. Um, and we also wanted to spread this model to other sites. So we actually partnered with um, uh, Denver Health, and they have a very different uh, system, and uh, Simon Hambage was the lead on that effort. And interestingly enough, they had more success in certain ways implementing their, through their efforts, than we did uh, at Kaiser. We also asked patient and provider experiences with this uh, look at their satisfaction and, and how they felt this model worked. I used the uh, PRISM model, it was probably discussed at some point here, um, and uh, added a couple things in there. You see focus groups and social networks. I don't know about all of you, but I get overwhelmed by all the sort of dimensions and constructs here, so I've developed the uh, PNC construct for DNI, which is pick and choose. Uh, and, uh, and basically, you use, you use that to adapt, you know, to select those key elements that you think of the models that, that are um, practical and adaptable. And that's also why I think in your materials you'll see some workbook questions that we tried to adapt in some of this work for a very practical way to understand sort of what questions you want to ask when you're thinking about implementing a new intervention in a, in a delivery system. So the social network map data was interesting. It provides certain dimensions like uh, network centrality uh, or betweenness. Betweenness, for example, is the, uh, how many connections an individual has. 
Um, power is a combination of betweenness and centrality. It's, it's people who have a lot of access to themselves but could block access to other decision makers so they could use this power um, in a positive or negative way. And reach, which is really the, the amount of uh, other connections that individuals have. We used a questionnaire with our pediatric sites. Um, it's probably hard to read, but it's essentially who do you go to for advice and how often around pediatric, uh, better ways of doing things concerning pediatric care. So it's a fairly generic uh, questionnaire. And we collected these from all the sites and then did this magical software to create these social network maps. And the lines aren't that um, clear on here, but what, what this represents is that at one of the clinics, we identified four uh, people, um, essentially opinion leaders, who had high um, betweenness and uh, power. One of them was a developmental specialist. Uh, two of them were physicians. Um, and one was a medical assistant. And one of the key lessons there, of course, is you always want to make sure that you're working with staff like medical assistants, nurse managers, and so on, who actually get the work done oftentimes here. Um, this individual is interesting. And uh, this, this person was the pediatric chronic care coordinator, actually was not adjacent physically in the clinic, but had some connection more, uh, more indirectly. Um, the idea of these maps is really that you can then identify these key leaders who have um, particular influence in a particular practice setting and make sure that they're included in the process of implementation, planning for implementation. Our focus group results um, really identified things that would work or not work in the practice setting as well. Um, there was a preference for choice for completing the pre-visit assessment, whether parents would, would or wouldn't want to, and it was about 50% from our findings. Um, appointment scheduling processes, I came to learn, uh, not being a clinical person, but I came to learn how uh, sort of concretized they are and difficult they are to alter when you wanted to try something innovative. So we had to really make these workflows compatible um, with uh, advanced access, for example, same-day appointments and so on. Um, there was a preference for flexibility, choice of clinician and visit type, and make this member-centric, tailor this to the needs of children and, and parents, um, longer visits for children with special health care needs. So that was verified. Our, our sort of idea of doing that was, was really confirmed by the providers and the, the parent um, participants in our uh, focus groups, our interviews. And then um, clinician time, big factor, of course, and we have to account for that in pre- and post-visit documentation. So I've actually ran through this very quickly, but a couple anecdotes I think uh, come to mind that for me were interesting because when you go through all these sort of conceptual frameworks and at the end of the day you find out that there are like certain little or big things, kind of key things that make or break. Um, timing of implementa implementation is one of them. For example, um, these, uh, this, the pediatrics department, I don't think was quite ready to, you know, on a full scale implement this. Um, they, they hadn't, uh, we talked about burning platforms at Kaiser. They, they weren't on that burning platform where they felt they, uh, across the board, had to change. And some wanted to and others, others didn't. Um, engaging key leaders is very important because, uh, and, and sometimes this is a bit of a um, crapshoot. Um, at the time, our chief of pediatrics had a, leader, uh, had a leadership style that essentially was very democratic and collaborative. But what the problem was is that allowed other chiefs at clinics to say, I don't want to or I want to do this particular implementation. So there wasn't actually uh, enough influence to support more widespread implementation of this model. And then the little single factors that can make or break. Um, and, and the story there is there, um, the pre-visit assessment was a parallel system to our electronic medical record. And some of the physicians told us, if I have to do two extra clicks on the mouse to import that information into the electronic medical record. It's not going to work. And in our system, it sort of takes an act of God to, to get the programming done to integrate things into our Epic EMR systems. Russ, Russ as well <laughs> knows this. Um, so those kinds of things can, can really make or break uh, a smooth implementation of a project. Um, one other anecdote was that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we talked about choice of pre-visit assessment offered to parents. And to me, that was a sort of a critical issue. But what, what we found was the participating practices varied in that. One practice was very flexible in terms of assessing that choice right at the beginning and signing up parents for getting on our uh, secured messaging site and getting them signed up for Chattis. 
At another site, they had such routines for uh, scheduling and getting uh, assessments done that they felt that they could only do it one way. So they didn't want to have 50% of the parents completing a web-based pre-visit assessment and 50% coming in. It interfered with their workflows, uh, despite our, uh, our suggestion that maybe flexibility and choice is a good thing for, for, the, for the patients and parents. So um, with that, I think I'll stop and uh, give you some time. Before we go on to the, our next speaker, David Goff, were there any clarifying questions? We can take one or two, if you had any questions about, or we can just wait at the end. Okay, all right, then we'll go ahead with. sit somewhere more comfortable for a few minutes. Um, well, I'm happy to be here to, I took, I meant to get the water bottle, not the tent. Isn't that funny? <clears throat> so I'm happy to be here to talk a little bit about our Help Prevent Diabetes study. It's a um, implementation study, a translation study, not really a dissemination study at the time that we started, but we're in a dissemination mode now, and we can talk about that during the, um, the discussion time. I don't really get into that probably in the first 10 minutes. So uh, we, one of the themes you, you heard, start with a proven intervention that's efficacious, and so that's where we started. So let's talk about diabetes prevention, and then Spiro may not have to do that. There's a whole lot of people with diabetes, and there's even more people with prediabetes. Prediabetes is the kind of thing, condition that increases the risk for diabetes. About 10% of people with prediabetes convert to diabetes every year. And there's a whole lot of people with prediabetes, 79 million in the United States and even more globally. Several big efficacy studies show that if you do lifestyle interventions, with people with prediabetes, you can reduce the risk of converting to diabetes. Okay, but those studies were done with highly trained interventionists working one-on-one -on -one with individuals in expert settings, uh, highly selected participants. 60% reduction in risk, but can we do that? We don't have enough trained behavioral interventionists to interact with 79 million people in the United States, much less hundreds and hundreds of millions, perhaps over a billion, Okay, hundreds of millions at least globally. So, what do you do? You try to translate that kind of intervention into something you can implement in the community. And that's where we were when we started this study now probably six, seven years ago. So we wanted to translate this highly efficacious intervention to something that could be done in the community in a group setting with lay health professionals, lay, lay health counselors really is what we started calling them, but now they're called community health workers. And so we, our setting was to get participants who were overweight or obese who had prediabetes and intervene in a, in a group basis instead of one-on-one -on -one, through an existing community resource, a diabetes care center, that would engage community health workers, lay people, in delivering the intervention. Uh, we had stakeholders involved in the community. The diabetes care center, as part of their certification, by the ADA has to have a community advisory board. So we had a community board already in place that we could work with and say we would like to expand the mission of a diabetes care center to include diabetes prevention. Are you in? Are you interested? Oh, they thought it was great. Okay, so that was wonderful. We, we were advantaged by that. Okay, so what did we do in terms of partnerships? Well, we had to have a partnership with the diabetes care center. Uh, that was the first thing. Uh, we worked with their certified diabetes educators to develop a partnership with them because they were going to be the ones who were going to host the intervention, as you'll hear more about. They were going to select the community health workers and train them, as you'll hear more about, and support them in their delivery of the intervention. So it was critical to have a good relationship with the Diabetes Care Center and their diabetes educators. Next, we had to have a partnership with the community health workers, and that partnership was at an arm's length because it was through the diabetes educators, not directly from the research team. 
And then if we also develop partnerships with community organizations that we're going to participate in and support the intervention. Some examples here are things like the YMCA. We, we had people come in from the YMCA and talk with our participants about the importance of stretching before going out to do exercise so there wouldn't be as many injuries. Lowe's Foods is a, is a major food chain in North Carolina where this occurred. And we had a dietitian come in from Lowe's Food and talk about how to shop and get healthy, affordable foods, and also took them on a, on a uh, field trip. And Fleet Feet was a um, shoe company that came in and talked about the importance of wearing good shoes that support your arches when you go out walking, because many of our participants were women and uh, lower income women whose uh, variety of shoes for walking might have been limited, right? So very important. They also provided discount coupons for buying walking shoes at Fleet Feet. And then, of course, we had to have partnership with the participants. That occurred at several arms links because that occurred between the participant and the community health worker. So, and then the community health workers were partners with the diabetes educators who were partners with the research team. So several arms links between the participants. So we were focused from the beginning on effective dissemination, and that's why we tried to keep the research team as far away as possible from the participants. The last thing we wanted was for me to see a participant. That would have been absolutely awful. And I can tell you it never happened, except when someone came up to me in the community who I knew and said, I got this letter from you, and it, do you think I'm fat? Because we did some community mailings, and they would say, I enrolled. And I was like, that's great. That's great. So we trained the trainers who trained the trainers. Uh, that's what the re not just one arm's length away, but at least two. We developed enduring materials that the community health workers could use so that they didn't have to be content experts. Uh, we monitored costs, including participant costs, because if you want to disseminate something like this, somebody's going to ask, what does it cost? We had a great economic analysis. And we had complete separation of research assessments from intervention visits. We had research assessments happen in the in our GCRC, what predated the CTSA, and um, done by separate staff who had no idea whether these were intervention participants or comparison participants. What else did we do to try to translate from the high-tech efficacy study to the, the simpler study? We simplified eligibility criteria. We didn't require an oral glucose tolerance test. Just a simple fasting glucose had very few exclusions. We did community-based recruitment, mailings, a phone bank, clinic referrals. Uh, we based it in the community-based ADA certified diabetes care center with our uh, certified diabetes educators. We recruited community health workers from their existing patient population of patients with diabetes who'd gone through diabetes education and made lifestyle change, people who were readily at hand. So they didn't have to go looking for community health workers very far away from their day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and the concept, which will come up again on the next slide, is that participants who went through the program could become the next group of potential community health workers. So when you ask me what our framework was, it was the Amway model. Yeah. Who remembers Amway? Uh, not very many people. Okay. So what else could I call it? The, could I call it the Tupperware model? Does that help or is that even further away? You know, somebody comes in and does a Tupperware party in your house, and then you're expected to become a Tupperware salesperson. Okay. So why did we take this approach? Well, the first thing we said, the research team can't possibly interact with all the participants with prediabetes. We can't even train all the community health workers that are needed. But maybe, just maybe, we could set up a, a training center where we could bring certified diabetes educators in and, and train them in delivering diabetes prevention in their diabetes care centers. Maybe we could do that. And so that was the model that we used. Why did we think this might work? <clears throat> there are over 3,000, last time I looked it was like 3,500 uh, ADA certified diabetes education centers in the country. <clears throat> think about that dissemination potential if we could get all of them delivering diabetes prevention. Okay, so how did we develop the intervention? We did the typical stuff, focus groups, we tested our material on our CHWs, they were patients with diabetes who'd gone through diabetes education, and we ran a group with them just to pretest things. We developed enduring materials, and we 
<clears throat> and we developed process monitoring tools, uh, including web-based uh, monitoring tools, to help support the um, community health workers. Did it work? Yeah. Body weight went down. This is the intervention group, lifestyle, weight loss, as opposed to usual care. Body weight went down. That was great. Blood glucose went down. Stayed separated. That was great. So it worked. And it actually saved money, although that's not what we're here. It saved money for everybody except the participants, which is something we'll have to think about. Maybe in certain models with high deductible insurance programs, it might even save money for the participants, but it certainly saved money for health system perspective and from a societal perspective. So then we had to figure out how to make that pay off for the participants who spent more money on shoes, spent more money on uh, food, turned out, uh, but spent less money on doctor's visits and so forth. And society spent less money. So what are the lessons we learned? Focus on proven efficacy. You heard that already. Think about dissemination first and second and third, fourth, fifth. When you're monitoring your implementation, always be thinking about dissemination down the road because it doesn't really matter if it works in your setting if you can't do it other places. And be cautious. This was, this was so hard. We would kind of think we were learning something in the middle of doing this intervention, and somebody said, well, why don't we do X next? It was like, well, can X be done in 3,000 ADA-certified diabetes education centers around the country? And if the answer is no, don't do X. For us, that was our answer. Okay, so tempting as you're going along to think you're learning something really cool and you can just tweak your intervention could ruin your ability to disseminate down the road. So be very, very careful about <clears throat> improvements and adjustments. You know, people will say, you've got to be flexible. That's true. But be flexible in a way that your ultimate dissemination channel could also be flexible. Uh, and then there's references. They said provide references, and these are going to be available on the web, right? So they'll be there, and it includes the economic analysis. So I think I'm done. Each of these slides are on um, the canvas, so you can see the vignette. And recognize you can't capture everything in 10 minutes. That's why we ask for references. So, David, it looks like there's a clarifying question. I'll go up here. Thanks, Camilla Sasson. Um, I just when you talk about your last point, I think is probably the most important one, which is, you know, how, how many times when you're doing CBPR does somebody want to change the intervention in the middle of it because it worked better here versus there? And so I think, Lane, you kind of mentioned this too, that the fidelity of your intervention versus pissing off your <laughs> implementers. <laughs> I mean, there's sort of a fine balance between that, and, and I'm kind of going through that with one of our studies as well right now. So can you talk a little bit about how you were able to hopefully appease both sides? That might work, yeah. So there's a lot of tension if you want to try to change your intervention. So there's several things. First of all, intervention fidelity you mentioned. So you want to, be, you want to have fidelity to the original efficacious intervention. So the diabetes prevention program, which is what we modeled on, was so very important that we were uh, as uh, kept fidelity. But then you learn stuff when you get out in the community. It turns out you learn stuff, right? So you want to take advantage of stuff you learn. But then you want to make sure that if you are taking advantage of what you learn, you're not uh, impairing the ability of your intervention to work. So you can do kind of a plus, maybe, or, or a tweak, maybe. But it also needs to be something that the ultimate dissemination channel can also do. So we, we developed DVDs. Well, the, the Diabetes Prevention Program didn't use DVDs. They used one-on-one -on -one highly trained interventionists. So that was already a departure to some extent. We didn't use highly trained interventionists. But there aren't enough of them out there for your dissemination channel to be able to go that way. Now, uh, trying to think of something that, you know, there was this idea that people who were not coming to the groups as often as they should, that maybe we should have some special toolbox approach and, and incentives and, and really, you know, super duper you know, focus on really trying to get everybody as adherent as possible 
to make sure they were coming into the group interventions. And at some point, we backed away from that and said, you know, that's something that we could do in this research study. But there's a limit to what a community-based organization is going to be able to do to try to keep the people in who just don't want to come. And so we decided to back away from